In a tourist study done on Loch Lomond side a few years ago, it was discovered that most folk gave enjoyment of the scenery as their main purpose in coming here. Most of them meant by that driving around, stopping at picnic spots or laybys, but more and more adventure off the beaten track these days, especially if there's a car park handy and an easy boat journey of a few minutes to an outstandingly beautiful island as here, Inch Kalyach, just across from Balmaha. Its popularity is not new, but whereas 20 years ago it was known only to a few outdoor enthusiasts, it's now visited by tens of thousands of visitors every year, and the number keeps going up. You might think there could be good reasons for being pessimistic about an exceptional island which is only one mile long and with an inviting sandy bay at its far end. But Dr John Morton Boyd, director of the Nature Conservancy Council for Scotland, who owns the island, doesn't subscribe to that. He wants people to enjoy all the things that are very special to this island, which today is a national nature reserve and is a supreme example of how man uses and changes a landscape. Ah, here's the reward. What a uh, beautiful view. Oh, great. Very so sharp good. today. Yes. I, I, I always like this point, Tom, where one standing with one's back to the highlands, in a few moments we'll be able to see the highlands. And here we can, in fact, look to the other side. To the moment. I really think this is an absolutely marvellous uh, site with the, um, the Kilpatrick Hills, um, the Gargunuk Hills, and of the Endrick coming in to this National Nature Reserve here. Um, it's really... Um, one of the points in Scotland, Tom, I think, that no Scot should be without visiting. Oh, no, the high drama of it. <laughs> yes, it's absolutely marvellous. Well, here's the top, Tom. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is magnificent. Just as clear as I've ever seen it here. Yes, yes. And the perspective, really, right the way through to the hills that... And what a view, the end of the lowlands, the rise of the highlands. Yes, you get this marvellous impression here of how the pastoral countryside of the lowlands grades gradually into the highlands with all the heather-covered mountains and the high tops uh, and this marvellous loch with all the islands and, and woodland in them. Uh, in, in here, Tom, you really see how landscape can, in fact, evolve in geological terms, in glaciology, of how the glaciers came, and, and then how man himself came into the picture, because here we have all the signs of uh, land use, of agriculture and forestry and recreation, as we now see it. But the great thing, of course, is that this is the Highland Boundary Fault. This is the real division between the lowlands and the highlands. And if we look now up onto the hill here in front of us, we can see the line which demarks the lowlands on the right and the highlands on the left. And this line extends from Kintyre right to Stonehaven. Right to Stonehaven. It's the great Highland Boundary Fault. And it comes through this island. And it's still a line of weaknesses because earthquakes do occur here. It is. And also, of course, uh, uh, you can see the ecological consequences. And no more than on this island, which, as I say, is a geological harlequin. The fault goes through it. On the one side, we have got um, uh, fertile soils arising from the serpentine, that is, on the north side. And on the other side, we have the old red sandstone that gives us poor soils. And, of course, this is what makes this island very interesting in terms of its natural history, in terms of its ecology. And also, when one comes to look at the use that man has made of it over the centuries, you find that that part that's on the serpentine was the part that had the farm, and the part that's on the old red sandstone is the part that carried the woodland. Mm -hmm. So here we have um, the, uh, the putting together of what I think must be one of the most beautiful parts of Scotland. We can travel far to Westeros and the Hebrides and the Cairngorms, but you won't get anything which is very much better than this for sheer beauty and 
I think really for the sentiment which the Bonnie Banks and Loch Lomond actually projects for Scotland all over the world, we do have it in fact. Here it's and there it's all in front of us. Don't you think so? Oh, absolutely. The uh, woodland here, and we see some of it in front of us, uh, uh, was uh, some 200 years ago the fields of a small farm. But there were other areas of the islands and of this island which obviously were, were forested. And this was an early form of afforestation. And the timber products there were not really for pulping as they are today in the uh, um, big production forests, some of which we see around here. Just look, Tom, at the tremendous spread of forestry which now goes up from Rower Denham. It wasn't forestry like that. In these days, they produced bark for tanning and wood for charcoal, for the bloomeries, for the iron industry. And they, of course, did not need the quantities of wood. And small woodlands like those which existed on the islands of Loch Lomond and on the banks of Loch Lomond, from which have regenerated the present broadleaf woodlands, were in these days productive woodlands. Because we can see within them the charcoal hearths of the cotters of these distant days. And that was for the smelting of iron. For the smelting of iron, yes. And uh, obviously the bark made the tan and the heartwood made the charcoal for the boomerangs. Uh, no, but what you haven't explained is how these woods, in fact, were harvested. How did they get the continual return from these woods because they're slow growing? Well, timber is a renewable resource and uh, broadleaf trees uh, regenerate from the stump. Not like um, some of the conifers, uh, which uh, when felled, will, stumps will rot, uh, do rot. Uh, so that there is a great regenerative growth from these stumps. And there is a technique in forestry known as coppicing, in which uh, uh, periodically uh, the forester goes around and he selects good leaders. And he takes the others and he may use the others for poles for building or fencing or all manner of different types of, of use but he will keep the leading standard as that which will make the future tree, which the will bark. be for the bark, for, for the bark and for the, the timber, for, for charcoal. This is how it was done. And as time went on, uh, the trees were thinned, uh, but were not, uh, in this particular instance, clear felled. And we have here a woodland which is the regenerative result of the, of, early of, of the early coppicing. But perhaps we might turn to the actual uh, uh, landscape itself in, in the perspective that we now see in the valley uh, which contains our beautiful loch. Because uh, here we have um, a fine impression of a glaciated rock basin. If you carry your mind right to the north end of the loch, Tom, you will see a fjord-like valley, uh, narrow and deep and profound. And there, of course, the depth of the loch is great because the glacier was travelling fast and it was gouging deeply down. 600 feet deep. Yes, in, into, 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 the, in, into the valley and making this great rock basin. But then as the valley uh, it widens out, as you can see here, so did the glacier spread out and the pace of the ice travelling lessened and the down cutting decreased and therefore the floor of the loch comes up to provide all this marvellous archipelago of little islands. And of course the ice would ride over them and polish them and smooth them into these elegant shapes that we see here. And then of course afterwards did come the trees. Where we are standing now. That's right, just here. Well, let's see some more. Okay. Now, like you've done, this here is an interesting place because we've got some wind blow here, you see, and the trees have fallen and the canopy has opened. Look, we've got Dog's Mercury here. Look over there. 
uh, just outside of the, uh, the bright spot. And you will see that the field layer is composed of bluebells, which are now over, of course, and bracken, a completely different situation due to the fact that the light is getting in. And also, you'll see in here, we have a bit of the coppicing that I was mentioning. There is the old stump of a tree, and there is the young oak leaders that are coming up in the coppice. And in due course, they will take the place of the old forest. And here we have blackthorn coming in. Now, there's no blackthorn actually under the dense canopy. Also, some rowan. Now, here is, here is a, a, a very good example of how the, the, the forest naturally reproduces itself. A wind-blown root platform upturned, improved seed bed, uh, a little bit out of the grazing pressure of the fallow deer, and up comes the new trees. And this actually, in this little clearing here, shows how this woodland replaces itself. It's, it's very the, interesting. The dynamism of nature. Yeah it's, the, it's the, yeah, it's the real process which you're seeing in front of your own eyes. And over here, trees, 100 years, 124 years, yes. 140 if you, if you years. Look, yes, if you look in here uh, with a seeing eye, you can see that the trees are in age groups spaced by 25 years or thereby. There's an old granny there which is approximately 150 years old and then a kind of um, uh, slimmer tree which is about 125 and then the, the, the thinner ones still are about 100 years old. Great. History in the making. Yes, yeah. Aha, here are the old farm buildings. Let's go along here. Quite a substantial foundation here. Yes, just take care. Yes, uh, like everywhere else, Tom, this tells its own story. Um, in this site, the, the farm buildings went right down to the loch side. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were in occupation something like about 200 years ago. But about 60 years ago, the, the oak harvest really finished here gave up, finished. And uh, then uh, the area around here regenerated naturally into the condition that we see it today. Sixty years before that, it was the height of the oak harvesting time, when there were horses here and, and the logs were dragged down to the, uh, to the loch shore and, and floated across. And sixty years before that was the farming era, when trees like this here, which you can see which has got a completely different habit from these that have grown since, uh, these long, thin stalks that have grown since, uh, um, uh, because this here is a part land oak. It grew in the open. I wonder what kind of food they ate often in these old days. Plenty of meal and tatties, Tom. Plenty of meal and tatties. And maybe a bit of milk and crowdy. Aye, and a wee bit of the uskaba as well. Oh, homemade. Homemade, <laughs> yes. This became uh, an early religious site uh, as far back as the 8th century when Irish missionaries, really someone called Kentigerna and her two sons, came and settled here. And she conducted a mission throughout the length and breadth of Scotland, but she came ultimately and died here and was buried here. That was in the middle of the 8th century? Yes, that's right. And in the early 13th century, a church was built here and was dedicated to St. Kentigerna, so she may have been canonised before that time, you see. But between, in between these times, this was a nunnery. And the uh, actual foundations of the, 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 the nunnery have, have been gone long ago. But the church that was built in the, er in the early 13th century survived right the way through to 1621. And during that time, it was the parish church of Buchanan. But then it needed a lot of money to repair it. And they decided that they would either have it repaired here or move to the mainland, and they decided the latter. So they built the Buchanan parish church at that time, and this church fell into disrepair. And until the kirk was built in the mainland in the 17th century, people had to row over here for the Sunday service. Yes, every Sunday, rain or shine, they, they came across. And of course, they came across for many centuries later until in the middle of this century to, to bury their dead. And we have here a burial ground 
which uh, contains uh, stones that goes back to the time of Rob Roy's grandfather, or thereby, and also of the McFarlands. It's strange, Tom, that the old enemy should repose here within the same resting place. The wild clan. That's right. On Inch Calioch, the island of the cold women. Yes. The, the nuns. The nuns. But it, it's interesting that um, we have this place which the, end, the Nature Conservancy Council discovered under all the bracken and fallen trees. And they discovered that the stones that had made up the church were used for making a wall around the burial ground. And this has now all been cleared and the wall has been realigned so that the whole of the foundations of the old church is now displayed and, and well kept by the Nature Conservancy Council mm -hmm. for everybody to see when they come. Mm -hmm. So, there, this is really one of the, the really important historical sites in, the, you know, in church history in the west of Scotland. There is a piece of stone at the door of the uh, chapel which is similar to that on one of the doors of the chapel of Vinstaffnage Castle. And this is, the, this is the, the, the one clue that shows that this chapel here was early 13th century. Mm. Now this wee bay we're coming to here, Tom, is Port Ban, and it's uh, the campsite of the island. You know, there's only 2% of this island that is used by man in the path of the trail systems and in the campsite. And 98% is left to nature. And the two get on tremendously well. And it means that with the campsite that people don't just need to come here for an hour or two. They can come here for a whole weekend. And they can um, live in it and let it steep into them and hear the bird song. And you can get, in a good summer day here, you can get as many as 300 people, actually, on this beach. This wee beach. Aye, uh -huh. on this wee beach. This is a national nature reserve. And people think that reserves are verboten for people. Couldn't, couldn't be further from the truth. They need to be used and understood. And the balance, and the balance can be, it sounds rather ridiculous, 2% for man. 98% for nature, but it works, and here is the evidence for it. Marvellous. Yes, and here we see the, uh, the outward prospect of the rest of the reserve. Uh, we have behind us Inchkailach, which had a farm and which was used by man for agriculture and forestry, but these islands were only used for timber. And that's one of the differences because there we have the effects only of the forestry which we were mentioning. Here we have the forestry and the agriculture. And if you go to each one of these islands, you will find that it is a different ecosystem from this. And every one of the islands is a little gem with its own character of woodland, of flora, of fauna, and of landscape within it. Room for man and room for nature. I found these figures of Morton startling, but I know what a superb place this is for woodland birds and for winter wildfowl especially, when thousands of geese come. So the management secret is to let the public have good paths and good trails, with points of interest along the way, each explained as they go along by means of a pamphlet. On Loch Lomond's side, the Nature Conservancy Council and the Forestry Commission's Queen Elizabeth Forest Park have learned how to cope with a lot of people compressed into a relatively short tourist season.
almost the, the Nature Conservancy came into being in 1949. And since that time, there's been a tremendous pressure on the countryside of Scotland. And in some ways, the conservation movement has had a lot of setbacks for the sheer pressure of economic events. What do you think the future of Loch Lomond is? Well, today we've been seeing Loch Lomond in detail. Of its woods and its islands, and its hills and bends, its beautiful amenity and natural history. But Loch Lomond also means people and policies and priorities. And I think that within the scale of priorities, we have here in Loch Lomond something which is truly international. It is famous all over the world, and it really has an enduring part in the hearts of the Scottish people for a whole range of reasons. It's also very important in a whole range of different types of interests, of agriculture and of forestry and of nature conservation and recreation and tourism and so on. And water conservation. And water conservation too, through the, the contributes a tremendous amount to the water supplies of central Scotland now and could do more in the future. And I think that the great danger comes from piecemeal development of people who in their generation don't have the vision to ensure that their problems, perhaps comparatively small and local problems, but very important problems in an area of this sort, are really obscuring the greater issues of total development and appreciation of the total area of Loch Lomond. We should never take anything for granted at all in nature and in human nature. And I do think that both nature and human nature must come together here in a grand plan for this area. And I'm certain that my council will have an important part to play because this is a wonderful area for wildlife, as you well know. And I hope that they will join with all the others in producing something which our old friend Frank Fraser Darling had of a vision of a grand plan for this area. He called it a national park. And I don't think it matters the name, but I think it's terribly important that everybody pulls together in order that we have Loch Lomond forever.